start up the next talk. So please resume your seating, if you will. Uh, there was a request for me to mention the gray whale that uh, was found under the Coleman Dock, the Seattle to Bainbridge Ferry Dock. Um, and I really don't know the disposition. It was towed to somewhere, and I understand there was a necropsy yesterday, but if anyone knows any kind of results, any cause of death finding, uh, please let me know and we'll let everybody know. But that would be fresh news this morning that I don't have. John Kalambakitas, who is in the room, I believe, is he? Uh, he's here, he'll know. So anyway, we will hear about that. So it is my great pleasure and joy to introduce John Durbin, esteemed veteran researcher, um, cut his teeth, so to speak, at the Center for Whale Research with Ken, uh, and in the Bahamas, and is now a global traveler, uh, has spent uh, many an uh, Antarctic summer, uh, looking at the, the types of orcas there, what they eat, how they live, where they go, and is a wealth of information and a, a great guy. So, John Durbin on how to measure orcas. Yeah. So. Okay, well, firstly, I'd like to thank Howie and Susan, all of you, for the invitation. Um, I've been meaning to come to one of these events for several years. This is the first I've been able to make it to, so thank you. Um, it gives me an opportunity to also to thank Howie and Susan for all the wonderful work they do in helping our understanding further, uh, or further our understanding on killer whales, and particularly to further the work that researchers do. So thanks, Howie. Um, the work I'm going to present today is, is, is how we're measuring size and growth of resident killer whales, and particularly how those data, how we hope those data can be used in conservation. Um, I'm just part of a team that, that, that are involved working together on this, and I want to acknowledge that team. First of all, many of the analyses and data I'm talking about today come from work that, that my wife, Holly Fernback, did for her PhD work and continues to do with her postdoc work at, at our lab, the, National, the, the um, NOAA Southwest Fishery Science Center. Um, Wayne Perriman, also at NOAA, has been involved in the development of these small hexacopters, these small drones I'm going to talk about today. Lance Barrett Leonard from the Vancouver Aquarium is a, an integral partner in our work for what we do on northern resident killer whales. And then you've just heard wonderfully from Ken. Uh, Ken Balcom and Dave Elliford at the Center for Whale Research are our key partners in studies of southern resident killer whales. So thanks to all of those guys. Um, this is a fun talk to give because it draws together two of my, my main interests and main research goals and, and, and themes. One of those is long-term studies of killer whales. You've heard from Ken that that we know so much about resident killer whales in the Pacific Northwest because of research that's been ongoing in the US through Ken and his co-walkers and in Canada through Mike Big and John Ford and Graham Ellis and since the early 1970s. Um, I've been lucky to be part of that over the last 25 years and it's really fun that I get to still be part of that and bring some new techniques to that work. So that's why this talk's so fun for me. Um, this, believe it or not, is me as a 16-year-old working with Ken at the Centre for Whale Research, and uh, I'll skip very quickly over that. Uh, so the second theme I want to bring together is, is, is work that we do at our lab in La Jolla. I work for the Southwest Fishery Science Centre, not the Northwest Fishery Science Centre in Seattle, but in La Jolla, and there we have a program that focuses on the use of photogrammetry. This is using photographs to measure size and other metrics of whales. So for example, this is a, on this example figure, we've got a fat and thin gray whale on the left, a rather large blue whale on the top right, and on the bottom right, one of our Antarctic killer whales. All projects that we do using photogrammetry. So here, what I'm going to be talking about is using photogrammetry in studies of the resident killer whales that we're all so fond of. Um, what I love about this, this artistic depiction on the right is this is a killer whale with a salmon in its stomach. And that's really what we're talking about here, as, as you just heard from Ken, is how intertwined killer whales are as top predators with their food sources, and, and how we can study if they're getting enough to eat. Um, we know that these guys are prey specialists. In this part of the Northeast Pacific, we have really unique killer whales, and killer whales that are not just specialists on fish, but specialists on Chinook salmon, large Chinook salmon. Um, when you're a prey specialist, that makes you very vulnerable to what goes on beneath you in the food chain. 
So today I want to talk about two populations of resident killer whales, the southern residents that we all know so well, um, that range widely in the winter but gather in this area in southern Vancouver Island in the summer, and the northern residents that also range widely but in the summertime are frequently found around northern Vancouver Island. And the special thing about these two summer aggregation spots in these populations is they're sitting in the salmon funnel. We've got salmon that are making their way largely up to the Fraser River Delta in this area. So we've got northern residents intercepting them in the north and southern residents intercepting them in the south. These populations do very similar things in different geographic locations. Um, Ken showed a plot of the, the southern resident trend shown here in blue over time. During that same time period, the northern residents have been steadily increasing except for that one period in the mid to late 1990s where both southern and northern residents showed a corresponding period of decline that coincided with those periods of lower Chinook salmon returns that Ken showed. And this was the first time that really concern about how much food killer whales had available to them came about. In a, a real seminal paper by John Ford, Graham Ellis, Peter Alicia, and Ken, um, they showed very clearly that both southern resident and northern resident mortality trends, these two spikes we see here, were correlated with what we see at the bottom there with declining abundance of Chinook salmon the year before. To put quite simply, when there weren't many salmon, by the next year, killer whales didn't show up in, in, in as many numbers. So this was very strong, but albeit correlational evidence that Chinook salmon were very important for resident killer whales. And at that, at that time, in the late 1990s, where we started seeing these first correlated declines, there was a lot of attention in the press. People started catching on to the fact that killer whales may not be getting enough to eat. Now recently, this, in 2012, um, National Marine Fisheries Service and Fisheries and Oceans Canada convened an independent science panel and a series of workshops to assess the evidence that changes in, in, in fisheries management would affect killer whales and would be beneficial to killer whales. Now one of the conclusions of this, uh, of this process was that although there's convincing correlational evidence, they still couldn't be firm that changes in fisheries policy would, would affect resident killer whales in a positive way. And one of the problems in my mind for this is that by the time, it, is we don't have very sensitive metrics of how killer whales are doing in terms of how they're interacting with their prey resources. By the time we do a summer census of resident killer whales and see if some of them have died from the year before, the problem's already happened two or three years down the line. What we need is sensitive metrics of how well they're doing before they die. Um, and the panel agreed with this. One of their key recommendations was to use more photogrammetry to look at um, how killer whales are doing relative to salmon. And in fact, they said that photogrammetry might offer one of the greatest insights into their foraging ecology. This was in 2012. Fortunately, we were a little ahead of the, ahead of the game on this. Um, in 2004, in collaboration with Ken, um, we started using these laser pointers on our cameras to measure killer whales. So on the left, that's me with two little green laser pointers mounted on the camera. On the bottom here, that's J14, and you can see two little green dots. These dots are uh, 10 centimeters apart. So by projecting these dots onto the fins of whales and photographing them, we have a scale of known size on the whale. From that, we can measure growth of the whale. So here's just a simple plot from one of our papers showing the height of dorsal fins of whales of different ages. So an adult female on the bottom left, a dorsal fin that's only about 60 to 70 centimeters high, all the way through to an adult male, J1, sadly no longer with us, um, on the top right um, with a fin that's you know, 1.5 meters high. So this method allowed us to monitor growth of certain body parts like dorsal fins. But if we know the size of the dorsal fin, we can then extrapolate the size of the body. So this shows kind of this technique. So this is two series of pictures of J30, another young male not, no longer with us. On the top when he was 10 years old, and there's some green laser dots on his fin, and we're able to extrapolate the size of his body on the left. And on the bottom, when his fin had grown a bit more, a few years later, and, and similarly, we're able to look at the, the trends in his growth of his body. This is what it looks like on a plot. So what this is on the y-axis is the length of the body from the blowhole to dorsal fin, the parts that we can see from a boat. And on the bottom are a series of whales of different known ages. Um, the red dots are, are the two measurements we have there of J30 from those two pictures. So over four years, you can see how his body length was growing, and it was actually a little ahead of the curve. That's one of the trends we see in some of these males that are passing away. They're large animals, maybe even a little ahead of the growth curve, they require more food. Now, one of the problems with this laser approach was very elegant and simple but we couldn't measure the full body size. And in fact, we had to look at growth over long periods of time to look at small changes with very long-lived animals. 
So what we wanted to do was, was get above these whales in the air, be able to look at the, their full body size, but also their body condition. How fat are they? In 2008, we had the first chance to do this using a, a helicopter platform. Um, if you can look closely at that, that, that's Holly hanging out of the side of the helicopter. <laughs> we operated under permit from National Marine Fisheries Service. We flew over 750 feet high, mostly over 1,000 feet, and we're able to obtain some spectacular images from the air. Here's one of those images as a close-up. Now, we, just, we weren't just interested in getting great images, but we wanted images we could use for photogrammetry. So to do that, we need to extrapolate from pixels on a screen to real size. And we do that by knowing the focal length of the lens, and um, also by knowing our precise altitude to within centimeters. Um, but one of the really key things to all these studies is that not only can we measure whales from the air, but we can identify who they are. So thanks to these long-term cataloging efforts going back to the 1970s, we have good pictures taken from the boat on the left that we can use to match the whales of known life history and known age. And we can identify these same pictures, these same whales from pictures from the air. So this, on the right here is a photograph of L78. It's becoming a bit of a theme. Again, a male no longer with us. Um, and you can clearly see from the air, a photograph taken from over a thousand feet up, that he's got this asymmetrical saddle patch. On his left, there's, there's far more black incur, incur, as an incursion into the saddle than on the right. And you can clearly see that same pattern from the boat-based photographs. So one of the key threads throughout this whole talk is that we're linking our measurements to known individuals because we can recognize them from the air, because of the hard work that's gone on over the last 40 years of photo identification. So this is one of the key results that came from that first study. Again, now we're not just looking at blowhole to dorsal length. This is full body length, plotted for whales of, of known age, no, the age is known from those photo ID studies. The white dots are males. You can see they get slightly larger in size than the females that are shown with black dots. In both of these cases, we showed an asymptotic increase in size with age. The males got to close to seven meters on average um, during their life, and the females about a meter shorter. But in terms of body condition and growth, one of the key insights we have from this early study was a hint that, that something was changing more recently. If we look at these females here, for example, these are females of adult age, between 20 and 30 years of age, but you can see they're below the average curve. They're a bit smaller than the older females. Now, these are females that grew up in a time when the population of killer whales were increasing, as we can see on the top plot, but the salmon, as we can see on the bottom plot, were decreasing. So this is that Pacific Salmon Commission coastwide index that Ken talked about. So these whales that were between 20 and 30 years old grew up in a time where there's more competition for killer, between killer whales for less fish, and they grew up to be smaller in body size. In contrast, some of the older females that were over 30 years old were above this curve. They were larger than average. They grew up in a time when, because of the live capture fisheries in the 1960s and 70s, there were fewer killer whales, but there were a lot more Chinook around. So they grew up with less competition for fish. So one of the key conclusions of this early study is we suggested that, just like humans, the killer whale adult body size might be influenced by our nutrition during early growth. You know, it's amazing now when I'm driving into work and you see all these kids going into school, and they're massive. You know, they're, <laughs> Because of our nutrition, we, we're growing up to be larger in body size, we know that. So we think the killer whales were too. But there's this disturbing trend that, that more recently they're smaller in total body size than they used to be. Again, this is a signal that over the long term, they're probably getting less food than they used to. But that, again, is a very long-term outlook. We wanted something that was more immediate. How can we tell how fat a killer whale is now and whether we need to do something about it? And this is where we started looking at body condition. I'm not sure if you can see these well, but on the left here is a very robust young killer whale. It's nice and fat, and on the right is a very skinny one. Now, the way to look at these images is by looking primarily at the eye patches. Killer whales are a wonderful animal for aerial photogrammetry. We need to be directly over the top of them, and we know if we're directly over the top if we see these white eye patches that appear symmetrical. If a whale, if we're not directly over the top, we see one eye patch more than the other. But in terms of body condition, a nice fat killer whale should have the eye patches that are getting further apart as you move down the body. This one on the left is, but the one on the right isn't. In fact, this animal has the eye patches that are actually getting closer together as you move down its body. And this was um, L67. These were the pictures taken on the last day she was seen, which she subsequently passed away. So we knew straight away that we could tell body condition from the air at a coarse scale. Um, but we wanted to do some more measurements to see if we could look at more subtle variation. So this is a plot that just shows the kind of an index of body width, the width relative to its widest point, um, against how far back you go down the whale. So 100% is actually at the dorsal fin. 
And these are just adult females in 2008. And that skinny one, L67, is shown by the black line. You can see we can see her, her thin head, we call it the peanut head, where they get thin behind the skull. And also that she was very thin behind the dorsal fin as you go down to the duncle here. Um, but just as interesting, and perhaps more interesting in the context of Ken's talk, is that we can learn something about reproduction. By looking at the, the same shape as we move back down the body of Kilauea, we identified that two females that were pregnant when we, when we imaged them, we knew that because the next year they showed up with a calf, we were able to identify they were anomalous and that they were the only two females that had maximum width behind the dorsal fin. You can see when they're pregnant. That means that we can actually monitor pregnancies that we may not be able to see through calves. Um, there may be animals that are pregnant, give birth to calves, stillborns, for example, that we don't see the next year. So this gives us a tool to more precisely look at reproduction rather than waiting a year to see if it turns up with a calf. Now, just to step back, we did this work in 2008. It wasn't until last year, 2013, that we received funding to do it again. Those images are currently being analyzed. Hopefully next year we can come back and tell you about how these same whales change in condition over that five-year period. We would like to make this an annual and seasonal study, and I can talk about that a bit later on. Because just by taking snapshot measurements of how fat a whale is or how long it is, it's hard to put that into context. We need a context to say how, what, how robust is the condition of these southern resident killer whales. But one way we can do this is to look at their neighbors, the northern residents. Remember, over the same time period, these northern resident killer whales have been increasing from about 120 whales to, to now over 260 of them. So we wanted to go and look at body condition of these whales and see how fat they were compared to southern residents. And this is where our use of, of the hexacopter drones comes in. You may have seen some of the press attention we got from this over the last few months. Um, where the northern residents aggregate in the summer around northern Vancouver Island, it's not as an accessible place as, as around the San Juan Islands. We didn't have ready use of affordable helicopter time. So we had to have a different approach to get above the whales. And this is the approach we took. This is our small hexacopter called Mobley. And uh, we have a number of different lenses on it, but effectively we're flying the same camera as the helicopter did, but from a lower height. So because this is smaller, quieter, um, our permits only required us to be above 100 feet in height, rather than above 750 feet as from a fixed helicopter. So already that gives us an advantage, you can take pictures from closely. Um, before I get into some details of the study, I do want to talk about permits, permits however, because drones, it seems, are in the news every day these days. Um, <laughs> We did need a stack of paperwork in order to fly this hexacopter above northern resident killer whales. In fact, the, the stack of paper weighed more than the hexacopter. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. I mean, because this is a US government asset, it's owned by NOAA. Um, the pilot, me, needs to be certified. The equipment needs to be certified and certified by the FAA. We have permission to fly in Canada from Transport Canada. And we have permission under the Canadian Fish, um, Species at Risk Act to fly above killer whales. So this, I, I have to emphasize, this isn't something we can just do as, the pub, as a member of the public. This was done under the permit. So this is our team, me on the left, Holly in the middle, and Lance barrett Leonard from the Vancouver Aquarium on the right. And the data and, and, and images I'm going to show you in a minute were just collected this past August um, in Telegraph Cove. Um, one of the big challenges with using these, uh, these drones to collect images at sea is that they're not designed to be flown from moving platforms. They're very good at hovering if you tell them what level is, and typically you have to program them when they're on the ground before you go to sea. So one of the great challenges in working with our engineers at NOAA has been to develop a system that we can take to sea, it remembers what level is, and it still flies very, very stably, when, even if we launch it from a moving platform. So this is the platform we use. This is the Research Threshold Scanner owned by the Vancouver Aquarium. And this is how we operate it, where Holly is, uh, I'm flying the hexacopter from the back deck here. Holly has just released it from her hands and Lance is piloting the boat, all nice and close together so we can all communicate well with each other. Um, I love this picture because I think it shows how non-invasive the approach we took is. That's a scanner on the left. Here's one of the uh, A30 killer whales on the right. The boat is several hundred feet away from it. And if you can spot the hexacopter, there it is. We're not buzzing over the heads of these whales. That is a, about 100 feet high. So this is our general approach. We don't need to have the boat right on top of the whales. We don't need a hexacopter right close to them. The hexacopter's high and the boat's a long way away. It really is remote monitoring. And remember, we're trying to assess condition, not influence it. Um, I want to show a few videos now, and this may or may not work, just to show you how our operations work. 
The first of these is a, is a deployment video, um, where the video comes from a helmet cam that I'm wearing. And what I want to show you is just how far up the hex cobble is going, that it's not buzzing around the whales, it's going out to 100 feet. So I'm going to run this through the countdown. So as I fly it out of Holly's hands, you're going to hear me, her, she then goes to a ground station, looks at the video feed and is telling me the altitude she gets on that. You'll see the whales are here in the background and I'm, I'm going to climb up and get the hexacopter over them. So I'll show you what that looks like. Here we go. And this is real sounds here. I'll just let it go. It's already totally quiet. So that's Holly counting out the altitude as I go up, so we meet our permitting requirements. 45, See how small it's getting? So that's 100 feet right there. And so what we did is went up to 100 feet before we moved over to the whales. So again, I show this to counter any belief that we're using a drone to buzz over the heads of whales. In fact, you can see that up there, we can't hear it, the whales can't hear it, and they can't see it, and we can barely see it. Um, the next video I want to show you is, is how we actually target it. So how this works is I keep my eyes on the hexacopter at all times, and I'm flying it. But Holly's looking at a ground station that's receiving video from the hexacopter, I basically video that the camera on the hexacopter sees straight down. When I'm over the top of the whales, she can see them, and then she tells me how to move depending on how they move. So what you're going to hear now is uh, Holly's voice as she's telling me where to go. So it's quite revealing. <laughs> um, so this is now video that's taken. This video you'll see is taken from the boat, but it's um, she's viewing video from the hexacopter. So there we go. Okay, I got him. Go up. So that's Holly telling me what to go. And the hexacopter is so high, it's out of frame. You just see it coming in the yeah, some side of the top. To the right, to the right, come down a little, down a little, down a little, down, down to the bottom of the frame, come down, down, down. So our distance down, now is about uh, down, 80 down. meters, 75. Okay, you have a, now move to the right, move to the right, you can come a little up. As whales are approaching the group of whales, probably day 42. Okay, so I'll stop that there for now. But again, you can see how this is really a team effort. And particularly flying the hexacopter so high, I have to keep my eyes on it all the time. And it relies on Holly and Lance in terms of positioning the boat and, and telling me where to go in order to keep this, this sensor over the whales at all times. The final one I'll show you before I show a, a few of the still images is just landing. And this is just after we've had this um, hexacopter in the air for about 15 minutes, we're constantly monitoring the battery life, making sure we've got enough battery. We bring it in and safely hand capture it from the boat. So I'll just show you that very quickly. Here we go. So my reason for showing that is just that instead of a helicopter that's expensive, dangerous, and can only be operated where we can find them, we now have a small platform that we're able to carry around with us to operate from small boats to strap to our backs to hike somewhere like we do in the Antarctica, and we can uh, collect the same kind of images. That was my main reason for showing you that, how portable and how easy it is to operate. Um, so, some quick, let me just go back up here. Now, there are some more videos later I'll show you. So, in just 10 days in, in Johnson Strait around Northern Vancouver Island this year, we uh, conducted 60 successful flights. That's more than 13 hours of total flight time. We didn't have a, sim a single glitch. The hex got performed perfectly. We collected data on all of these flights. In fact, we got images overhead of all 82 whales we saw. Um, and we collected around tw uh, 20,000 images, all of excellent quality. We have the same kind of success that we've had in our two efforts using a helicopter for southern resident killer whales for the fraction of the price and with much less danger to, to researchers in the helicopter also. Um, we were really excited. But what we were most excited by is the quality of the images we got. Remember, these were images taken from a hexacopter at 100 feet, and it hadn't quite dawned on me until I saw them how much better they would be from the camera in a helicopter at 850 feet, for example. But effectively, we're flying the same camera much lower. 
Um, this is an image of the part of the I-15 Metro line of Northern residents. You can see a little young of the year in the middle here, and I-15 is mother above him. You can immediately see that we're getting incredible resolution. Our resolution from 100 feet is about two centimeters. So we, we have the resolution to look at differences in size and body condition of these whales very easily. And we collected 20,000 images that all look like this. It's just incredible. Um, but again, just as with the helicopter pictures, one of the key things is we could recognize different individual whales from the air. Here's a picture of uh, the, the entire A42 mantra line, um, incidentally with a little oil spill from, from a, a salmon fishing opening that happened on the same day above in the top corner. I zoomed in a little bit, and you look at the whale in the middle, that is A42, the, ma the, the matriarch, and I'll zoom in a bit more, and you can see her saddle. That top picture is taken from a hexacopter over 100 feet high, but look, you can see the detail of her saddle just fine. These are pictures from the boat on the same day, you can see that little finger she has in her saddle. We have no problem identifying the whales from the air, um, and uh, that was very comforting to us, because that's the key thing we're trying to do, is match measurements we can take from the air with known individuals. And uh, one of the things we were really, really surprised about was that we photographed some incredibly skinny whales. Remember, we thought these would be the fat cousins of southern residents. But immediately when we got above some of these whales, particularly the I-15 Metro line and some of the A-30s, they were very, very skinny. So remember what I told you about how to look at body condition of killer whales. Normally, they're spindle-shaped, and the eye patch gets further apart as you move down the body. But look at this guy's eye patches. They're actually flapping around. You can see this really narrow area behind the head. In fact, you can see the shape of this skull. You can see the, the vertebrae. Um, it's, it's really a pretty scary image. To put that into context, this is him on the left. So he's A37. On the right, there's another adult male. That's I47. And look at the difference in shape. The, the one on the right is nice and robust. His eye patches get further apart as you move down the whale. And the guy on the left has a really, really skinny head. You can see the outline of his skull. In fact, again, this picture was taken the week before he disappeared and, and presumed dead. We also, unfortunately, found some skinny females. This is I-63, who had actually given birth earlier this year. Graham Ellis had seen her in May with a calf. This was in August with no calf. And look how skinny she is. Again, you can see these, her, her body width actually getting closer together as you move down the, down the body. The eye patch is getting closer together. She, too, died and didn't show up the next week. So that was two whales that immediately we saw in our first week that we could tell they were in terrible condition, and, and they didn't show up. But there was some good news as well. But I think in terms of monitoring and our ability to monitor them, there was a lot of good news. This picture shows me all I needed to know. It's a picture of part of the I-15s. And there's three females in here I want you to look, notice. The one on the top, that's I-63, the very skinny one. The one in the middle, a nice robust female, I-15. And the one on the bottom, look at her shape. She looks a little different. Remember, she's got that maximum width behind the dorsal fin. She is heavily pregnant. I'll zoom in again on, on her at the bottom. Look at her different shape, maximum width behind the dorsal fin. It could be that our ability to detect pregnancies, and remember, this is pregnancy probably on average about a year into the 17-month gestation, our ability to detect pregnancy is maybe the most important use of this technology. As Ken highlighted earlier, understanding who's pregnant, how many calves they're having and losing before we, before we detect them the next summer could be a really key component to understanding population dynamics. We identified several whales that we think were pregnant during this study. There's some good news too, robust calves. Um, this little calf, I love this little gray guy. I mean, look, he sets off the exposure on the picture wonderfully. He's, he's nice and gray and mottled, but he's pretty fat. Just a few months old, he's in good shape. His mother, I-15, was in good shape. That's a good sign. But even the smallest animal in the population, even without doing our quantitative measures, we can tell that he's in good shape. The, the resolution of the images was that good. And we saw feeding. So this is a whale, with, this is one of the A-30s with, with a salmon in its mouth. Here again is two more of the A30s chasing a, a salmon that you can see in the, in the middle here. So we're getting resolution to, in fact, not only identify fish, but measure fish. Um, so when it comes down to measurements, again, we can do a lot with just shape um, in terms of body condition, but we still want to put that in a quantitative sense. If we want to look at changes over time, we need to put, make that, uh, translate that to the absolute scale. So we do this, again, just as in the helicopter where we use GPS to look at altitude, on the hexacopter we use a pressure sensor to drive altitude from changes in pressure. To see how well we do with that pressure sensor, we also take pictures of the boat. This is a picture of the scanner above, from above. Sorry. And on every day we take a photograph of the scanner, and uh, 
we know the length of it, and so then we can, using our, our, our calculations of scale, using our altitude estimate, the focal length of our lens, we can convert pixels to real length and see how well we did. And this is kind of hot off the press, but we do really well. The average bias, this is from 20, uh, we had 20 different boat photographs that were good quality. Our average bias was less than 1%. That's far, and this is, I, I should go back and say the length of this boat was 6.4 meters. Remember, that is whale size. An adult female is about 6 meters, an adult male 7 meters. So this is a good calibration experiment. We estimated the, the true length of the, of the boat to within 1%, to within about 5 centimeters. That precision is equivalent to what we were getting from the helicopter with much more precise measures for looking at altitude. So we think we've, we've, we've cracked this. Not only do we get, do we get precise or, or crisp images, but we also get precise altitude. To show you how that, how that might work, um, we're still analyzing most of the data, but I'll go back to this picture of these two males. Both adults, one of them is older than the other one. Interestingly, the skinny guy um, was also quite fairly, fairly short.